I wondered, I, Joyce says, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. He could have said, history is a nightmare from which I am hoping to awake. Or history is a nightmare from, from which I am waiting to awake. But he said, try. Do you think that was chosen and pivotal? Or is there a, a, some kernel of truth to be explored there? Well, he didn't. Joyce put these words into the mouth of Stephen Dedalus, who said, history is the nightmare from which I am trying to awaken showing that Joyce could write because he didn't put the participle where it would dangle. Uh, but this was in Ulysses. Uh, I think, you know, Joyce came to terms with all this ten years later in The Wake. I mean, uh, The Wake, I'm now speaking of Finnegan's Wake, was his masterpiece and to my mind the ur text of what I'm saying. Uh, Finnegan's Wake is a book about everything melting into everything else. It's about uh, all, as he says, all space in a nutshell. Uh, it's about uh, union of opposites and dissolution of boundaries. And in that sense, as all great literature must be, it's prophecy. And it's prophecy about the world we're now living in, but it's a deeper prophecy about the world we're going going to live in. Uh, yeah, I think that that is the text we should be studying. And people think of it as, you know, this obscurantist dumping ground for all the unused words in the English language and so forth and so on. It is many things. But it, he had an incredible awareness of the sweep of history and of the stages of history and of the necessary conclusion of history. He was a Viconian. He, he was a fan of Giambattista Vico, who was the, one, the first person to actually lay out one of these cyclical historical schemes of collapsing ingress. Yeah. Well, are you suggesting that um, individuals that ingest the five milligram, five grams of um, mushrooms will have an effect on what happened in 2012? Or, you know, what what's the significance of people that do experience that? landscape that's not seen. I think it's a way to liberate yourself from anxiety. It's sort of a way to grow up. That, you know, if you're worrying about your car payments or how you need breast enlargement or any of these things, then I'm not sure you are fully grounded in the big picture. And psychedelics give you the big picture. I mean, they, they show you exactly where in the cosmic scheme you fit, which doesn't mean that they diminish you. It's not a, oh goodness, I'm a mere speck in the cosmos perception. It isn't that. It's, it shows you precisely where you fit. And that relieves anxiety. And as things proceed toward the concrescence, it's going to get crazier. We have an immense capacity for craziness. I mean, as an example, uh, the Soviet Union, the great menace, this historical nightmare, yada, 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 it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's nowhere to be seen. And most people's attitude is, yeah, so what else is new? Uh, so this immense event happened, it only happened five or six years ago, and we're already on to, yeah, so what, uh, some, something. Uh, but as time speeds up, change is going to come faster and faster. We will have our perestroika. And, you know, all the smugness about those silly Marxists and how they couldn't get it together. This society is fraught with contradictions like nothing Marxism ever dreamed of. And when the chickens come home to roost in this scene, you may be sure the f shit will hit the fan. Am I stringing my metaphors here? Uh, to, <clears throat> uh, 
and the the hardest thing to do is to preach catastrophic transformative change in a place like Esalen. I mean, I've been coming to Esalen since 1975. Every time you come here, uh, the staff, the people I know who live here, they take me aside and they say, oh, it's just, it's just getting wilder and wilder and the factions are rising. We're having big changes. There's been a lot of big change recently. And, you know, well, hell, you know, they must have microscopes I don't have because as far as I can see, they haven't tightened a bolt or turned a screw around here since 1980. Uh, and and that and Esalen, I'm not knocking Esalen. Uh, uh, Esalen, though, is a microcosm of our society. We say change, what change? You know, I have to decide whether I'll vacation in Hawaii or Southampton this year. <laughs> That's change. Go to Bosnia, go to Rwanda, go to Bangladesh, go to Bangkok, Calcutta. The sense, or even you know Moscow these days. The sense of chaos is palpable. It's palpable. And you, I don't mean you have to go to a crisis scene like Rwanda. Just fly into Bangkok on a normal business day and you will suddenly understand something that you can't understand by reading newspapers in this country. You'll understand what population bomb, third world explosion, uh, high technology, what all these terms mean because those folks are eating it right and left. And here in the quiet ivory towers of the managerial societies where the grand metaphors are handed down to everybody, not much seems to be happening. It'll come here last, I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, even Europe is in turmoil compared to the United States by a long shot. I mean, Europeans are not so so weirdly... Um, childish or something like that film last night you know they had problems they dealt with them it didn't require uh, exegesis of D- second Daniel or as it would here they just solved their social problems by lightening up a little and society didn't fall apart Th- this is a bastion of recidivism and conservatism, and let's do it the old wayism, and it's a disgrace. You know, we're losing money, we're losing time, and we're losing a sense of participation in the global adventure. Uh, but it doesn't matter because the changes that are coming can overwhelm any political scheme. I mean, eventually, the planet itself will weigh in. And, you know, this is not something that can be finessed by politicians in collusion with the New York Times. It's bigger than that. Yeah. Instead of, instead of suggesting that people should go to uh, Bangladesh or someplace, you might as well suggest they should go to Watts in Los Angeles. But the interesting thing happens. Watts doesn't exist anymore because we have decided it doesn't exist. I got a map from the automobile club, a fairly recent one, which shows all the suburbs, and what is isn't on it anymore. <laughs> well, how Orwellian, right? Wow. It's not there. <laughs> I had to look on an old map because I wanted to show somebody where it was, and I had to dig out old maps on my archives to find it. No, it was. But the AA club says, what? Never <laughs> happened. <laughs> it it I never I happened. It doesn't exist. Well, remember in 1984, in George Orwell's dystopia, the hero or the anti-hero, the main character, Winston Smith, he worked for the Bureau of, uh, of Records in the Bureau of History. And the Bureau of History was this enormous skyscraper, and it had this neon sign that went 24 hours a day that said, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And this was the motto of the state. And under that motto, they rewrote history constantly to, for the party's purposes. And, uh, and this goes on just exactly as this example. Um, but I, I am, my basic thing is not political. I think we can practice smart politics or silly politics. 
but the wave that's coming will wipe out all politics because it's not a political deal. It's an evolutionary and transformational deal. Where we're headed, you can't even imagine. I can't imagine. Have you ever tried to, to dimension the post? Uh, oh, yeah. There's hard and soft visions of it. Um, uh, for example, um, well, a very soft vision meaning not requiring Christ and the angelic host to land on the south lawn of the White House, would be, suppose people just started behaving appropriately. We talked about this. You know, how if we began to behave appropriately, the world would completely change. I mean, suppose we began to behave appropriately right now. You know, first of all, we'd have to think for a minute. But when you decide to behave appropriately, the gnosis usually cuts in. My fantasy is that we would, first of all, get outside. We would walk out of the building. And then we would take off our clothes. And then, having left the building, having taken off our clothes, we would have changed the context of reality so much that it's hard to say what the next appropriate thing would be. Maybe we would all make love in a heap, or maybe we would all go get large, heavy objects and begin uh, smashing all machines. I don't know what appropriate behavior would be, but that's one vision of it. I think it's something much more dramatic than that. I think we have to go to religious epiphany to understand what's happening. And that uh, that all boundaries will be dissolved. That's what I think will happen. And then trying to imagine it, I can't. Because everything is defined by boundaries. I am me, you are you, the past is the past, the future is the future, here is here, there is there. If all these distinctions were to be removed, English would fail and everything would flow together into some kind of a plenum, a holographic manifestation of the fractal structure that underlies everything. Well, if that then what that means is that what happens in 2012 is everything happens. And how can that be? How could everything happen? I mean, how could things happen which were mutually opposed to each other? Well, apparently one of the things that happens is that that kind of either-or logic is exposed for the Aristotelian fraud that it is. And that, in fact... A can be A and B at the same time. A Boolean logic of some sort or a, a hyperdimensional logic replaces ordinary logic. I think we become immortal. I think that our religions <coughs> are our guides, that something unimaginable is casting an enormous shadow over what we call history. And that something from the very beginning, perhaps before life left the ocean, that thing at the end of time, now only 18 years away, was calling matter toward it, was calling organization toward it. It is trying to turn the universe into a mirror for itself. It is trying to see what it is. And biology, geology, psychology, human history, these are all mirrors of the divine, if you want to use an old-fashioned word. And it is coming into manifestation. It is turning itself inside out. It, the universe is becoming its creator, if you want to think of it that way. And... Uh, it, it's uh, bigger than the biggest of us. And uh, we human beings, you know, we are taught by Christianity that we were created in God's image. 
a funny notion. I mean, you look at yourself standing naked in your bathroom on your scales and you wonder, God's image? God must be a weird looking sort of entity if that's true. But in a way, I think it is true. And our society is an image of this thing. And so the, the mind, the connectedness, the network, the wiring everything together. What we want to do is we're trying to create something which is simultaneously the resurrection body, a flying saucer, the philosopher's stone, the human soul, and the lotto jackpot, all at once in one package. And as things previously separated flow together, the thing is gaining power and it's been building itself since the universe burst into existence however many billion years ago but now the pace has incredibly quickened this is strangely enough the promise of all western religions judaism christianity islam are united in one incredibly unlikely perception the idea that God will enter history. That's what those religions teach. To, to a Buddhist, this is the ravings of a diseased intellect. It, can, it makes no sense at all, that statement. God will enter history. And yet, this is what these religions have maintained over millennia, refining it. First, you know, the, 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 the primary revelation to Abraham and then the whole recension of the New Testament and then Muhammad's final setting of the dials before secular scientism made this game obsolete. God will enter history. That's the promise of our religions. And I think it's an intuition. It's not something that even the people who preach it understand. It's an intuition that you cannot escape. It's an intuition that you cannot escape inside the psychedelic experience. And you say, why do I believe this? It makes no sense at all. Why do I believe this? It makes no sense at all. You know, uh, Tertullian was told of his belief in Christianity. He had been a great... Uh, uh, a great Gnostic thinker. He was said, they came to him and they said, why do you believe this stuff about the resurrected Jew? It's absurd. It's ridiculous. And he said, credo te absurdum. I believe because it is absurd. This is uh, first century AD. What a brilliant and prophetic man. I believe it because it is absurd. And therefore, it compels belief. And I think that's what this thing coming is all about. It has to believe in, be believed in because it is absurd. But what is equally un, uh, unlikely is its absence. I can't live with the idea of 10,000 years more of human history. It, it would be a nightmare. You can see what we're headed toward rationed resources, propaganda, rigid programming, complete control of the population. There's no other way to manage ourselves. And so, the, but God will spare us that horror by decreeing an end to the historical caesura. Uh, and the religions, I am not religious in the sense that I, I dismiss these organizations as scheming weasels who want to get into your pocket and your pants. But this intuition is, is, is true. And uh, uh, we need to make sense of it scientifically. I think it can be made sense of scientifically. I think we have kept our eyes averted from the problem of time because science can't be science if time is a shifting set of variables. 
Remember how we talked about science depends on experiment to do its business? So science has kept its eyes very modestly averted from the problems with our model of time. But it's, it's very real. And tonight, if we get a computer, I'll show you a model of time that I think is more like the world you're living in, more like your own experience, except that it leads to this impossible to come to terms with conclusion that we are on the cusp of the greatest transformation since life appeared on the planet, at least. Yeah. Well, that was sort of one of the questions I had was that the evidence that you've been citing so far is local. It's, it's earthbound evidence. And is this event uh, a local event, or does it have more cosmic implications? Well, that's a great question, and one I've spent a lot of time on. Uh, As I said to you a couple of days ago, I think, I'm not sure we're talking here about the God who hung the stars like lamps in heaven, as Milton said. More, I think we're talking about the bursting of a Gaian egg. But, because my theory predicts the future, uh, I, I... am constrained to tell you that since 1972, 74, when I finished my theory, uh, it has indicated that the most novel day of the year 1994, that the most novel day of the year 1994 would be the 23rd through the 26th of July. Well, now it happens that this being that year, I've been waiting for something novel to happen on the 23rd through the 26th of July, so I won't have a failure on my hands. And the solar system has obligingly provided a planetesimal impact on the surface of Jupiter. Astronomy magazine called it a one in a one in a hundred million year event. Great! How fortunate that I'm around to see it. You see, you can tell there's something wrong with their model if it's a one in a hundred million year event, and you just happen to be standing there when it happens. That's a coincidence too great to ignore. And the philosopher of science, P. W. Bridgman, in a famous statement once said, a coincidence is what you have left over when you apply a bad theory. That's what you get, is a coincidence. Uh, So I, at least in answer to your question, now think that this is about the solar system. What occurs to me as a nice denouement that would just settle the thing very precisely would be um, if at 11.18 a.m. December 21st, 2012, minus nine minutes, the sun were to explode. That would nicely do it then. Rainforest preservation, yen to dollar ratio, HIV, it all would suddenly fall into a new perspective (laughs) if the sun were to explode because this planet would vaporize nine minutes later and all life would die instantly. Interesting concept, die instantly. You know, the Argentine surrealist writer Jorge Luis Borges has a story. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but the idea of this story is that a species cannot enter hyperspace until the last member of the species dies. And until that moment, the entire species is corralled in some kind of limbo, waiting. So the explosion of the sun would liberate the last member of many species. It would be a great dying. And that sounds like a holocaust, except, except, remember, that we don't know what dying is. We haven't a clue. And 
So uh, it's possible that the pessimists and the optimists are going to discover that they were both right. And the people who are running around saying, we're all going to die, we've ruined the earth, we've wrecked it, now we're going to go extinct, are in fact correct. However, this is the purpose of biology. Biology populated the planet to come to this moment. Now, I I don't seriously suggest this because I don't seriously suggest anything, but it is an interesting model. And there's something wrong with the sun. I don't know if you know this. It's not much talked about. But um, the the, the nuclear chemistry has been worked out in very great detail since the 1930s. It's not complex if it's your profession. Nuclear chemistry is very, very straightforward uh, in 1994. However, theory does not agree with measurement when you look at the sun. If the sun is the kind of nuclear reaction that we believe it to be, then for reasons not at all clear, it's emitting 30% less neutrinos than it should. There is no way to account for this except to suppose that one, Either nuclear theory has something wrong with it, and if it does, this is the only problem we've discovered that where theory doesn't match up with measurement. Either there's something wrong with theory, or there's something wrong with the sun. Well, what could it be? Well, the sun is a nuclear furnace. If it were to be, if it were to go off the boil, its neutrino output would drop by the observed amount. What that means then is that sometime in the last uh, 100,000 years, nuclear fusion ceased at the core of the sun. And the sun is as it's, it's like a pot of water that boiled, but then you turned the heat off, but it boiled for a moment longer. That moment is the last 100,000 years. And at the center of the sun, the process of cooling is slowly making its way to the surface. And when it arrives at the surface, the sun will not explode. It will undergo a 70% reduction in energy output almost within a day or two. That would effectively freeze out this planet. Uh, There are other forms of instability in the universe that could make themselves felt. We know that many times in the history of this planet, uh, enormous planetesimal objects have impacted. I showed you the picture of the moon being born on the cover of Scientific American when a Mars-sized object smashed in to the archaic earth over the billions of years that have followed this has happened over and over again not mars sized objects but dig the fact that an object 30 meters in diameter slammed down 50,000 years ago out near flagstaff arizona and created a crater a half a mile across and everything within 800 miles died instantly 65 million years ago, an object smashed down uh, on the Yucatan, what, what is now the Yucatan Peninsula, breaking up as it entered the atmosphere, a second fragment impacting near the Solomon Islands. Nothing on Earth larger than a chicken lived through that experience. I mean, you want to talk about uh, 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 an apocalypse... That object it was on the order of, uh, oh, I don't know, half a kilometer to a kilometer. It depends on the speed at which it was moving, so it's hard to estimate its size, but it was on that order. It was five miles into the planet in the first ten seconds of the impact event. 
It was five miles deep into the planet in the first ten seconds of the impact. It raised a wall of rock 125,000 feet high that moved out at 15 times the speed of sound from the impact zone. I mean, we're talking about a blow that if you had been on the opposite side of the planet, it would have thrown you across the room. Uh, That happened. There was an earlier one at the Cretaceous-Jurassic boundary 220 million years ago. These things are out there. We are studying them. There's a whole program at NASA to study what are called the Apollo Earth Crossers. These are objects greater than 30 meters in diameter that actually cross the orbit of the Earth. That means at some point in the future, they have a potential for impact. Well, if we fail to detect one of these things and divert it, our, our social systems would come apart completely under an impact of even moderate size. So the Earth is a dynamic and dangerous place. And I think that biology doesn't ever stand still that that we are essentially we were born in a taxi and uh, we're going to have to get out of the taxi at some point it's not home and uh, it's possible that we sense this we sense an impact or a catastrophe one of the peculiar things about the catastrophe which killed the dinosaurs is there's now virtually universal agreement that this happened, meaning the other theories have more or less had to knuckle under because they just didn't have the evidence. But the strongest piece of evidence the anti-impact theories had was a a curious um, drop in the overall number of species immediately before the impact. And by that I mean in the million years preceding the impact, a great dying was underway of some sort. That biology is not three-dimensional like we are, and that the reason a great dying was underway was because biology somehow, in some minded sense, was able to anticipate this incredible catastrophic event that was headed toward it. And so the die-off began before the event underwent the formality of actually occurring. And it could be, then, that the planet, as it recovered from this shattering event, in a sense made a resolution. Never, ever again can this be allowed to happen to biology on this planet? Never again must we be victim of this kind of an impact. Well, there's only one way to avoid an impact like that. They're inevitable out there in the future. There's only one way that a planet can avoid that kind of trauma. You have to take an animal you have to cut it from the herd and you have to say you are going to be the species that protects us from this kind of an event. And how can an animal save a planet from impact with a planetesimal? There's only one way, through technology through an ability to build hydrogen bombs and deliver them to their target accurately and uh, and quickly. And so we're it. We were chosen. We have become deputized to make the journey into the secrets of matter, to gain the power necessary to actually be able to protect the planet, to do more than wring our hands. A century ago, we could only have wrung our hands. Fifty years ago, we could only have wrung our hands. Now, if we had sufficient warning 
and the physical parameters of the problem were within certain limits, meaning the object not too large, not moving too fast, we could probably blow it to smithereens. And, uh, and I think that this is probably the raison d'etre of, of Western civilization and science, that this power which we use to incinerate those who dissent from our political point of view is not for that. It's for keeping the planet intact from the inevitable dynamic catastrophes that the physical universe uh, deals out. Um, well, so that's one scenario of to answer your question of what would the end be like. It may not be like that at all. It may be something completely different. I've noticed that in, the, in terms of this acceleration phenomenon, what is accelerating is technology. Uh, technology and our own evolution seem so intimately connected that they are almost the same thing. Well, we are now talking about star flight, time travel, downloading ourselves into circuitry, uh, genetic replication of information so that we can store ourselves in flounder and tomatoes and octopi. We are currently debating a number of transformative technologies that are not like building railroads, digging ditches, or stitching better sails. We are contemplating technologies that will change the face of, of ourselves and nature forever. And I think, you know, the rate of technology has never been faster. The rate of new inventions, new discoveries, new principles, all pouring together. And I think we said at some point in this workshop, what is keeping the transcendental event from happening is simply the momentum of our habit of not letting it happen. But if we would lift the barriers, if all information could be freely exchanged among laboratories, scientists, social planners, so forth and so on, we don't know at this point what we're capable of. The hardware that we have created far exceeds the capacity of any software that we have written. We have hardware that we don't know what you can do with because we haven't written the software to take advantage of its speed, its depth, its uh, iterative uh, potential. And I think the tools are already being placed before us that will allow us to either understand and flow with the transformation that is upon us, or to create it if it is reluctant to appear on schedule. You know, Plato said if God didn't exist, man would invent him. Well, the Western idea of God entails the idea of his entry into history and the salvational scenario. And so I think it's safe to say that if that salvational scenario doesn't exist, then human beings uh, will create it out of the imagination, out of the psychedelic imagination. That's it. I thought you meant that, that 2012, mankind would die, not from a, a, a catastrophic event, but something that we're doing would be a progressive thing, like disease is epidemic, or et cetera, et cetera, and we were killing ourselves, and it would, it would show within 18 years. No, I'm looking at something much more dramatic oh. and sudden. Oh, I no, I mean, we're going to have prob- We're going have a lot of problems for the next 18 years and an enormous number of triumphs and breakthroughs. It's going to be uh, like it has been only more so up until around, I would say, by 28, 2008, 2009, around there, I think that I will have either given this wrap up or this will be the dominant paradigm. And every, because the, either if I'm right, the signs will build. It's not going to take us by surprise. It's not going to jump us. The signs are building. I maintain with my particular tweaked vision that I can see it already. 
the light at the end of the tunnel. But maybe I'm bananas or something. So let's give it five years. Let's give it ten years. But I think it's going to turn out to sound more and more and more like the only game in town because our political systems are failing. The, uh, our ability to control our technology is absolutely beyond us at this moment. And I think factors are just going to keep accumulating. I, my, I, my career is a phenomenon of this. I mean, 25 years ago, this rave got you hospitalized. Now it's a profession, you know? And it may be orthodoxy in 15 years. And 20 years from now, it don't matter anyhow, does it? Uh, it will either have arrived or I will have slipped decently away into retirement and the whole thing will uh, be something else. You know that time is slowing down in contrast to our acceleration against it? You mean like natural time? Well, it depends. I mean, either we're speeding up or it's slowing down but the sum total of the system is an impression of enormous acceleration. And, and, and that's, I think, what we have here, an impression of an enormous acceleration into the unexpected, the unpredicted, and the, the mysterious. And then if you love all those things, the unpredictable, the mysterious, the unexpected, you love what is happening. And if you hate those things, you absolutely hate what is happening. You say, you know, the world is getting worse and worse. It's getting terrible. Uh, Agony, hunger, hysteria. These things are spreading. That's right. But not faster than integration, information, managerial skills, strategies for salvation, and new technologies and social inventions. It's all of a piece. But my faith is novelty will win. It is winning, or we wouldn't be here talking like this. Novelty is winning, and it will win. And therefore, you know, sit back and enjoy the show.